all appearances to the contrary, notwithstanding, I am not a real preacher, but a kind of an imposter. If you look online under ministers in the Christian Reformed Church in North America, you will find my name as inactive and furthermore withdrawn. In many denominations, the rule is once ordained, always ordained, unless defrocked for misbehavior. In the CRC, you can only be an ordained person if one, you serve a local congregation, two, serve on behalf of denominations such as chaplains, seminary professors, and missionaries, and three, are either sick, on sick leave, or on study leave, or you are retired. And when some 10 years after ordination I was none of the above, this was understood as voluntary withdrawal and my ordination was revoked. So the last time I preached here, I was still a regular preacher, but not anymore. But I never got rid of, of this, what is known as a Genevan gown, called the Genevan gown, intended to hide the individual and accentuate the God-ordained office. The question now is, do I belong in this gown? So, given what you now know, should I keep it on? Or take it off? <laughs> Do we need to have a vote on this? All those in favor? All those opposed, same sign? All right, we'll keep it on. But that sort of brings us to a question, does it not? What makes something or someone authentic or real or true? Is this a true church? Are you all real Christians? Is your religion authentic? To be sure, we, were, we are not the first to ask those kinds of questions. The Pharisees in Jesus' day had their own ways of judging who was truly committed to the cause and who was not. According to the Pharisees, Jesus himself was an imposter. And the Pharisees knew this because they saw Jesus' disciples picking grain on the Sabbath. And so it was obvious that these disciples had broken one of the 613 commandments the Pharisees had found in the Torah, one of which was to refrain from doing any work on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees taught that in order for them to remain in God's good graces and to be seen as a true Jew, they had to keep each one of the 613 commandments. And now this Jesus, being their rabbi, by permitting his disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath in violation of the commandments, this Jesus was now guilty by association and therefore was not to be trusted. Perhaps you've heard of the Belgic Confession one of the three foundational confessions of the Christian Reformed Church dating back to 1561. It too was concerned about discerning the differences between what they thought was false religion at that time and the true church. And the Belgian Confession asks, what are the marks of a true church? And the author of the confession, Guido de Bray, came up with this answer. The marks by which the true church is known are these. If the pure doctrine of the gospel is preached therein, if she maintains the pure administration of the sacraments as instituted by Christ, and if church discipline is exercised in the punishing of the <coughs> sin. Of course, this too required some serious preoccupation with the details of sin. Was it sin to ride your bike on Sundays? Was it sin to wash your car on Sundays? 
Were sexual sins worse than all other sins? Like the Pharisees, our forefathers became quite good at compiling lists of sins. We have to do this right, seems to be the tone, the spirit of this requirement. There is not much room for error. But also, I'm afraid, <clears throat> not much room for the human spirit to soar. Some people decide if they're true Christians based on how well they keep the law. It is also not unusual for people to decide on the basis of how they feel. People feel different when they attend mega churches. To be surrounded by a large group of like-minded people spiritually all on the same page. Something happens when Christian people attend Christian concerts. Oh, to be swept up in the emotion of the music. Some of you may remember Promise Keepers. The thrill of being surrounded by thousands of your peers shouting aloud as if preparing for a great battle. Or perhaps the Billy Graham crusade. Hearing that deep, resonant voice saying those beautiful words from the Bible. Why, you just couldn't help yourself. You just had to come forward. Other people believe that their faith is real based on their proximity to holy places. Places that have somehow come to be associated with a unique appearance of the divine. Places that remind us of specific parts of the story of God's presence in the world. Bethlehem, for example, where Jesus was born. The River Jordan, where Jesus was baptized. The Sea of Galilee, where Jesus walked on water. Calvary, where Jesus was crucified. The tomb, where Jesus was buried and from which he arose. These places became sacred destinations, worthy of great honor and veneration. And so today, there is a whole industry of visiting sacred destinations in the Holy Land. People come to visit all the places in Israel that are mentioned in the Bible, and these visitors feel just a little closer to God for having made the trip. And frankly, when back in the Middle Ages, hostile forces trampled all over these holy places, emotions ran high. And it didn't take much to round up a large group of crusaders to march on the Holy Land to fight the uh, intruders. And then these crusaders, when it was time to return home, were no different than we might be after visiting a special place. They brought home souvenirs. A piece of wood said to be a piece of the cross on which Jesus died. A piece of cloth said to be from the linen found in the tomb of Jesus. A piece of leather said to be part of the whip that Jesus used to clear the temple. Whether these really were what they believed, what they were believed to be, did not matter. But to have these relics brought home by somebody who returned from the Holy Land, to have them present in your own town somewhere in Europe, that became a thing in itself. I'm, it made it possible to imagine yourself as part of the story, part of the story of Jesus. And so there again arose an entire industry. The acquisition, display, and veneration of relics, along with the notion that to see or touch or even be near one of those holy items would somehow fix whatever ailed you. And we may make fun of that. And in the, at the time of the Reformation, there were people who said that that was a horrible thing to do, and that those people were terribly mistaken to do that. But it became for them like the closest way any of them would ever come to touching the hem of Jesus' garment in order to be healed. For some, it was the last hope of healing after decades of suffering. 
People traveled for miles to see or touch or to be near the holy thing, even if it could never be proven that the thing really was what it was purported to be. This was their faith. Today we sing, He Touched Me by Andre Crouch. Back then, they said having a relic made it possible for people to say, I touched him. And so it was around the year 820 AD that the remains of St. James, presumably one of the 12 apostles, were found near Santiago de Compostela in northern Spain. How they got there is a story all by itself, which I will let you explore at your leisure some other time. What matters today is that when Bishop, local Bishop Teodomiro heard about the discovery, he wasted no time and told his friend King Alfonso II of Asturias about it. Alfonso promptly made the three-day walking journey from Oviedo to what was to become Santiago de Compostela and so became the first pilgrim on the Camino de Santiago, the way of St. James. In time, Santiago became a huge destination. For the next 1,200 years, millions of people from around the world made their pilgrimage to this final resting place of one who was thought to be a member of the inner circle of Jesus' 12 disciples. On the site where St. James was buried, a large cathedral was completed in 1211 AD. A statue of St. James near the entrance of the cathedral welcomes the faithful and for more than 1,000 years people have touched the feet of St. James as they entered the church. As did I when in 2016 I entered that cathedral after walking the 500 miles from saint jean pied du port in the French Pyrenees to Santiago de Compostela, 38 days of walking, 12 to 15 miles a day, sleeping in local hostels called Aubergs, eating a simple pilgrim meal with other pilgrims, walk, eat, sleep for 38 days and 38 nights. So yes. When I finally made it to that cathedral, I too touched the feet of St. James, as millions had done for more than a thousand years before me. It felt like a religious moment. The whole journey actually had felt like a religious experience. To be in that cathedral felt like I had entered into a special place, perhaps even a holy place. It is easy to get swept away by the emotions of various religious experiences. Who doesn't feel that sense of awe on entering a massive cathedral? Who did not feel a strange sense of loss at the news that the roof of Notre Dame in Paris had collapsed from a great fire? How easy it was for money to be found for the repair of this beloved cathedral. Who doesn't feel strangely lifted at the sound of a majestic pipe organ starting the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah, anticipating the burst of joyful sound when the choir joins with those timeless words, Hallelujah? Who doesn't feel that sense of peace and assurance when hearing those familiar words spoken at the baptism of yet another baby? I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. How about holding and opening the family Bible? Seeing those names and dates of relatives, perhaps going back many decades, and now you get to walk somehow in their footsteps. How about when you listen to your favorite Christian artist? I wake up each morning to the sound of Sarah Grove's song called Enough. 
Here's the refrain. Really, we don't need much, just strength to believe. There's honey in the rock. There's more than we see. In these patches of joy, these stretches of sorrow, there is enough for today. There will be enough tomorrow. Every day, those words add a little oomph to my step when I get up in the morning. That's enough to get me going for another day. What about hearing a great sermon by a gifted preacher? Not like me. You can find them on the internet. I'm pretty sure that some of you have done that. First listen to Pastor Paul preach. And frankly, I love how Paul preaches. But then you go online and find an even better preacher with a bigger voice and a bigger vocabulary, with bigger words and a bigger church. Why? It's enough to give you goosebumps. Now, I doubt that there's anyone here, anyone here imagines the Christian life is a, a never-ending series of mountaintop experiences. And I would be surprised if there are people here today who, like the Pharisees, think that being a Christian is all about obeying 613 rules. For most of us, it is a kind of curious blend of trying to live by the rules mixed in with the occasional spiritual mountaintop experience. For most of us, it's regular church attendance. It's in Bible studies and other ways where we're, we are able to encourage one another and build each other up. It's in our prayer life and our personal devotions. It's our sharing in the life of the congregation, sharing in each other's joys and sorrows. It's in supporting various ministries by contributing some of our time and money for both. And as Pastor Paul regularly reminds us, it's by showing our gratitude for the gift of salvation by living moral lives and loving our neighbor. And yet, at times, we can't help but the Lord. Between all of our ordinary lives of Christians com combined with all our mountaintop experiences, is it enough? What if, in addition, as the Bible says, we believe in our hearts and confess with our lips that Jesus Christ is Lord? Will that be enough? Will God be satisfied with that? It is almost as if the author of the book of James, himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, was asking that same question. Is our faith life, are our church practices, are our doctrinal convictions and our assorted religious experiences, are they good enough for God? Throughout the book of James, we learn that unless our faith somehow finds some expression in good deeds, our faith may leave something to be desired. Faith without works is dead. And then, amidst of all that, we find this little gem, which is our text for today. Do you know what is really good enough for God? Do you know what kind of religion God has zero complaints about? Do you know what kind of religion God finds not just acceptable, but even pure and faultless? That is, it covers all the bases. It makes God happy and satisfied. Do you know what kind of religion that is? It is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. To take care of the poor, the lonely, and abandoned people of the world, and to keep your nose clean. How different from all we've heard most of our lives if you were raised or worshipped for any length of time in the Reformed tradition, if you've been part of a Protestant church, we learned that we don't actually please God by our good deeds, they told us. Well, apparently we do. 
All our righteous acts are like filthy rags, rags, they told us from Isaiah. Well, perhaps not. How strange that sounds to Protestant ears. Catholics have no difficulty with the book of James and its emphasis on letting your good deeds confirm the sincerity of your faith. But for us Protestants, wasn't that what the Reformation was all about? At least one of the Reformers wasn't sure that the book of James even belonged in the Bible. Martin Luther thought that James was what he called an epistle of straw, which should have been excluded from the canon. According to Luther, the book of James contradicted the first and chief article of the Christian faith, namely, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, and God's word alone. The message in the book of James, that good works serve to demonstrate that your faith is real, did not sit well with Luther, but he never went so far as to actually remove it, remove the book of James from the canon. And that is how today, your interloper preacher can still point to this verse from a once questionable book in the Bible to help us all see what sort of religion is truly pleasing to God. So what about Living Stones Church? How are you doing when it comes to practicing real religion? I already know that you don't take the rules too seriously. I mean, you allow a guy like me on the pulpit, 613 rules and commitments, that's just too many. Is anybody here today for the splendid architecture? High, arch high arches, painted ceilings, beautiful statues? Anybody? No. Well, what about the amazing sound of your pipe organ? Anyone here for the concert you put on regularly? No, no. I, I hope that you know that I'm just poking a little fun at you right now. But let's be serious for a moment. What had, has God provided you with, with which to practice true religion? What do you have here, perhaps more abundantly, than in many other churches. I'm going to make you say it out loud, so shout it out. What do you have here in abundance with which to truly worship God? Love for each other. All those are true. I'm looking for one word. Faith. Faith, yeah. Love. Love. What do you have in abundance in this church? I may be wrong about this. We have to maybe uh, broaden the definition a little bit. Okay, well, let's broaden the definition a little bit, and let's just include in among the widows all single people, all elderly women. I'm looking at uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, four guys in this entire congregation. Five and six, if you count Rick. In this entire group, and and the rest of you are, are, according to my definition, widows. Widows. God has given this church widows, because that is what true religion is: the care of widows and orphans, and to keep yourself clean from the world. So what that means then is that you are particularly well equipped to practice true religion, religion that pleases God, because you have widows, and you know widows, and you know what widows need, and you know how to communicate with widows, and communication is more important than you might think. I know that Pastor Paul does a great <coughs> job helping you all stay as connected to each other as possible. That has been my job at the church I belong to in Chino. Um, so I have a little bit to do with the widows in, in my church. And one of the things that, um, that I did many, many years ago 
There were two ladies, Adriana and Emmy, and they both had lost their husbands at an early age, and they had become friends. And they actually took care of each other in an amazing way. They visited with, with each other twice a week. One drove to the other's house, and, uh, and they, they practiced what they said was called open house, so they welcomed anyone to come in and visit during those times. And they served amazing refreshments and even some adult beverages. And then one of them, the one that drove to the other's house, lost her driver's license. And so a whole bunch of people from the church signed up to drive Emmy to Adriana's house so that this friendship, this 40-year-old friendship, could continue. And it did. For the next 10 years, that's what happened. People from the church drove one widow to the other and in the process learned about what it actually takes to take care of widows. Take care of what it, to, to learn what it takes to, to, to give them a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, and a sense of joy in their life. And so they actually visited. We had probably 40, 50 people on that list who would drive Emmy to Adriana's house and then sometimes late in the evening drive her back home. And then at some point when Emmy actually passed away, um, they did it for another number of years. They just came to visit Adriana. And so there was a lot of people that, that learned from Adriana, who became 104 years old, by the way, she just passed away a few weeks ago. Uh, they learned from Adriana how to take care of widows by doing it. And, uh, and so, as I said earlier, Adriana, who had lived for 104 years on this earth, finally moved in with Jesus. I'm not so sure that the system that we had in Chino would work here the same way, but I want to share with you um, this morning about something we do not with the widows, but with the widowers. And like I said, widows is a pretty technical definition. In fact, if you go elsewhere in the Bible, there, is, there are some verses that talk about who is qualified to be on the list of widows. That's kind of a scary passage. Let's not think about that. Today we're going to include everyone in the list of widows. If you're a single person, if you need companionship, if you're at risk of being isolated, you're on the list of being a widow for our definition today. But I also want to share with you what we do in Chino with the widowers. That's a different group of people. We, uh, I meet tomorrow morning. I will be uh, at 9.30 at the church and meet with a bunch of retired guys. And uh, let me tell you about the sleepless nights. Because I meet with the sleepless nights. We meet, as I said, every morning at 9.30. That... Uh, that time keeps the young bucks from taking over. That, that's when most of them are out working. We are retired. We need some time by ourselves. Time not pretending we're busy, like the young bucks often do. Officially, our name indicates that we are servants of God who, according to Psalm 121, neither sleeps nor slumbers. In reality, perhaps it has more to do with the number of times we get up each night. You know what I mean. We open our meeting with a simple prayer. We thank God for each person present, and we pray that we may, most of all, first and foremost, we pray that we may be good listeners. For that's why we come together, to listen attentively to what each person wants to talk about. Our group, usually between 8 and 12 of us, is small enough that in an hour and a half we manage to go around the room twice to give everyone two opportunities to say what's on their hearts and minds. We tell the group what we did since, since the last time we met. Trips, health concerns, issues with children and grandchildren, victories, celebrations, failures, ongoing challenges. To the untrained ear, these may seem like mundane subjects, even boring. 
Nothing like the lofty spiritual conversations you may hear in other small group meetings and Bible studies. But we are not about telling inspiring stories. We are about intentionally listening well. You'd be surprised how rarely good listening happens in ordinary life. We seem to be surrounded by people who are ready to interrupt, change the subject, take over the conversation, have a better story, or up, offer unsolicited advice. So we, the Sleepless Nights, decided to work harder at becoming better listeners as a gift to one another. And perhaps after much practice, a gift to others in our sphere of influence. Our rules to help. No interrupting, no crosstalk, no cell phones. We just listen. Listen to sometimes rambling accounts of conflicts between our children, or about when a car broke down, or about some TV program that was particularly interesting, or even boring. And as we listen, we are also reminded of things in our own lives. Things that perhaps we had buried deeply because we had no place to go with them. Nobody to talk to them, talk about them with. And so we find that in our second round, it, we often touch on things that are closer to our hearts. Things that usually come up only during the sleepless hours of the night when there is nobody around and the best we can hope for is to fall asleep and forget that the issue ever came up. During our second round, we may hear about a daughter sinking, in, sinking into the black hole of mental illness, or about loved ones with dementia on the immediate horizon, about the sense of powerless when the next generation starts making all the decisions in the family, about how angry we are for having our driver's license taken away, or about the incredible joy of holding a newborn child for the first time, a newborn grandchild for the first time. As I said, we all see ourselves in the stories we hear. That's how we love one another. We listen well. Former U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy says that the number one killer of men in America is not heart disease, cancer, or obesity. It's loneliness. As life progresses, many men feel increasingly isolated. And I'm reasonably sure that that is to a large degree true for women as well. The generally competitive nature of our work environments, along with the perceived risks associated with admitting needs and weaknesses, leaves many men carrying their burdens alone. Retirement often cuts off even the superficial work-related connections that kept our isolation at bay. When we retired, we did not suddenly become bastions of empathy and unconditional positive regard. We still like to hear our such talk. We still have petty prejudices. We still have little patience for endless verbal diarrhea. That's why we only meet for an hour and a half per week. But during that period, we are committed to one thing and one thing only, excellence in listening. And as we listen, we discover real life, real joys, real tragedy, and for that brief moment, we walk together and we feel like somebody cares enough to pay attention. And we experience a greater sense of belonging in what may otherwise just feel like a loose collection of unconnected people. We are the sleepless nights. Franchises available everywhere. For widows? You ask? Yes, lady knights do exist. Read up on Joan of Arc for details. But I'm sure you understand by now that sleepless nights are not so much about fighting as they are about listening, about supporting one another in the end game, helping each other finish well. And participants do not need to be particularly religious to join. 
This could actually be something you invite your elderly neighbor to who hasn't put in church for a long time, <coughs> if ever. This can be a resource for widows or widowers, although I would keep the two groups separate. Loneliness is not limited to men only. Pastor Paul all know, knows all about the value of groups that meet without an agenda. That's what his estuary meetings here at the church are all about. It's just a small suggestion. I'm sure the deacons are doing other things to help care for widows in this community, both within and outside the church. But to sum up, this is what that passage in James is all about. This is the sort of thing that makes God smile. This is the kind of religion God finds no fault with. Caring for widows, orphans, and other people with unique needs. God will bless your effort. And it's fun too. Let me know if you want to get a sleepless nights group going here at Livingstone's Church. I'll be happy to help you get started. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this reminder of what is important to you and what you care about and what you find makes you smile and what you find without fault. Thank you that you walk with us and that of all, of all the forces in our life, you are the great listener. Thank you for that assurance. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs>